Well, good morning. Uh, glad you're here. My name's Evan. I'm one of the ministers here at Bethany. And uh, can I just say this? I'm so thankful for this place. Uh, whether you're a part of our, our Washington uh, campus or you're joining us in Vincennes or you're online, uh, man, I, I often think about this. We're a part of a special place. Uh, and, and a place isn't buildings. Um, uh, the, the place is the people. And uh, I'm super thankful that, that you guys love on me as a minister and I get the opportunity to love on you as a pastor often. Uh, we're going to continue on in this series called Rise Up. You know, Alfred Noble was born in 1833 to a family of engineers um, in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, just like his parents, he decided to become a, a prolific, uh, not as an engineer, but in chemistry. And after going to Paris in 1850 for an inventor's fair, Alfred Noble was intrigued by the unpredictable nature of a substance we now know as nitroglycerin um, and its explosive power. So the goal was he wanted to harness the power of nitroglycerin. He wanted to harness uh, the power of an explosive and sell it for commercial use. And so he created what we now know as dynamite. He was quoted saying this, my dynamite will sooner lead to peace than a thousand world conventions. As soon as man finds out that in one instance, a whole army can be utterly destroyed, well, surely they'll abide by golden peace. Years later, uh, after he had made uh, thousands and thousands of dollars off of his invention of dynamite, his brother Ludwig died. Now, a French newspaper picked up uh, the, the story, but they had flip-flopped the names, and they believed that it was Alfred that had died, so they went with that in their newspaper, and they ran an obituary for Alfred Noble. He wasn't the one that had died, right? It was his brother. And so the next morning, Alfred Noble awoke to find his own obituary where it said this about him. They called him the merchant of death. He became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before, they wrote. You see, Alfred Noble had both the pleasure and the horror of reading what people truly thought about who he was and what his life uh, legacy would be. And from that moment on, he said, I, I can't be known for this. And so he set out to be known for something else. And uh, the year before he died in 1895, he set up a, a last will and testament that gave all of his masses of riches to establishing what we now know as the Nobel Prizes that are given out every year in different forms of, of language arts and, uh, and uh, science and philanthropy to simply promote doing good to others. How will you be remembered? When you die, what will you be remembered for? You know, that's a loaded question, isn't it? It's a loaded question because in that we are acknowledging the fact that someday, as the Apostle Paul these, these, called these bodies mere tents, the tent will stop, will stop working, right? The, the heart will stop beating. The lungs will stop breathing. Death will come knocking at our door and we can do nothing to stop it from opening the door. We will die. As well, though, we're acknowledging the fact that we'll be remembered for something, albeit we'll only be remembered for about three generations. Ask your grandchildren, if you're, you, you have grandchildren, or ask the, the youngest generation you know, ask them if they know their great, great grandpa. I guarantee you that very few will be able to call them by name. We're usually forgotten about 100 years after our death. So, so maybe we're asking the wrong question because our lives are just mere vapors, a, a, a passing summer shower, a, 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 a quick wind in the day. They're, they're here today and gone tomorrow. So if that's true of our lives, then maybe we shouldn't be asking how will we be remembered? Who are we in our legacy? Maybe we should be asking instead, who are we right now? How are we thought of? What do people think of who we are right now in this, this very moment? For those who are in Christ, who have believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul challenges us with these words. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Your, your death physically compares to your death spiritually. It, it, it pales in comparison because, well, we're all destined to die. 
because of our sin. It goes on in verse 2. It says, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. You know, everybody loves to talk about the love of God. Few of us, though, talk about the wrath of God, the justice of God. Now, he may be the way maker, but he hates the lawbreaker. Psalm 11, verse 5 says that he hates the wicked with a passion. But why God hates wickedness, he loves righteousness, which is seen in his son Jesus and offered to us as a free gift of grace by the finished work of Christ on the cross. Verse 4 of that passage But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. You see, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. You see, if you're in Jesus, your life has forever been changed. And why? Yes, yes, you will die physically. You will live eternally. You see, Jesus is in the business of turning death into life. Only God has the power to think what we to take what we think was dead and to make it alive. So don't ask the question of how will you be remembered. Start asking the question of how will you be what will you be known for in this life? Uh, turn with me to chapter 11. It's on page 871 in the Bibles in front of you. We're going to be in a story of, uh, of Lazarus. It's the whole chapter of John 11. So uh, go ahead and, and turn on over there so you can uh, flip back and forth with me as we study it out this morning. John 11 for me, the story of Lazarus is Uh, Of all the miracles of Jesus, of all the moments where you see Jesus powerfully working uh, amongst the people, uh, Lazarus' story has to be one of the most, you know, awestruck moments for me. Lazarus had died. He was dead. It was clear that he was dead. Actually, Jesus said it like this in verse 11 of chapter 14, Lazarus is dead. His physical body has breathed its last. The heart right? It had stopped beating. The, the air in his lungs, they were, it was no longer. Spoiler alert though, right? Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. So here's the deal. What do we remember Lazarus for? How many of us remember Lazarus because he was a great businessman? How many remember Lazarus because of how he fathered his children? How many remember Lazarus for the house that he had built? No, we remember Lazarus for the life that was given to him by Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't want a small part of your life. I think that's where we oftentimes get things wrong. We think, oh, you know what? I'm going to give Jesus the first day of my, or first moment of my, my day, right? I'm going to be in God's word. I'm going to say a prayer, start my day off right. I gave Jesus that part of my day. Or you know what? I'm going to give Jesus the first part of my week, He's going to get the first day of my week. On Sunday mornings, I go to church. Uh, and then, you know, I, I kind of just chill out and relax and start my week off right with the Lord. He's going to get the first part of my week. You see, Jesus doesn't want a part of your life. He wants to be your life. There's so much to learn from the story of Lazarus that God has for us in Jesus. But here's, here's what I know. In this room and Online, maybe sitting behind a, a tablet right now or on a computer or at our Vincent's campus, there are people that, um, that find themselves unsure of this. You, you know there's other folks around you or people you know that truly do believe in this Jesus, but for you, you're just like, eh, not me. You have more doubts than you have answers. And, and you're just like, just hold on. I, I don't believe the way you, you seem to talk up there, pastor. That's all right. You know, we, we say it often around here. We want, both, we want both the believer and the doubter in this place. So, so it's all right. Ask those questions of God and watch as he, he answers. For some of you, though, you're, you're, you're somewhere else in that journey. You've believed long ago and you've, you've been following Christ. You've experienced the life that he has for you. But, but for all of us, we're somewhere in the journey. So here's my hope. Today is that I can just help encourage you on to take your next step. 
Because that's what we're on. We're on a journey. We're called to take steps of faith. Even if you have those doubts, I want to encourage you, keep searching out the answers. Because I truly believe God will answer those questions and those doubts that you have. The first truth is this. Don't rush the work of God. You ever heard somebody say God's timing is perfect? Kind of cliche, isn't it? Sounds nice to say, but doesn't always feel that way, does it? We've thought it before. God, I need you in this situation. But then it seems that he's a few steps behind what we believe is perfect timing. To the mother, diagnosed with cancer, in the height of her children's younger years. To, to the, the couple that believed it was the perfect time to welcome in a new baby to this world, only to have their hopes crushed by another miscarriage. To the father who's lost his job just as he was getting the family finances in order. To the loved one who's prayed diligently for the, God to intervene in that person's life so that they'll come to know who he is and how they, that he loves them. But, but that person just keeps going farther and farther and farther down a path of destruction. To those folks, does God's timing seem perfect? Does God's will seem dialed in in those moments? Is it believed to be right? And often in those moments, there, is, there are big questions that arise, right? Questions of uh, our free will choices and God's sovereignty. And there are overlaps in this. There's an overlap of God's sovereignty and our free will that I don't completely understand. But God's timing, well, it's, it's God's timing. It's not always my timing. Pick up with me in John 11 where we hear this unfold in Lazarus' story. Verse 1. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the, the one you love is sick. Verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Time out there. You catch that last verse? Hey, hey, Mary and Martha, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. They send word. Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick. The one he, he loved, as the scripture titles it. And what's he do? He stays there two more days. Come on, Jesus. If you really loved Lazarus, why didn't you leave right when you heard about it? Well, why was it that, that he, he waited? He, he, he said to, to, to love these people. Why was it his timing, their timing? You know, God's greatest desire is to be in relationship with his beloved creation. God is working together amidst the chaos, amidst the, the frustration, his sovereign plan. With that in mind, Jesus knew that, that a delay would be good. I don't know why he delayed. I, I, honestly, I, I wish I had the answer for you, but I do know this. He had salvation in in mind, salvation of mankind in mind. He knew what his purpose was. It's like this. I look around into this world and all I see is disarray. I see frustration. I see uncertainty. I see cluttered minds and distracted world. I see less and less faithful followers of Jesus. And after a message series like we heard a few weeks ago from Ben Merrill on the end times, I'm like Maranatha, which means come Lord Jesus, come. Like, Jesus, would you just come back and take home your church? I'm ready to go. My timing says, it's time now. Eastern sky, would you split and would you return for your loved ones, Lord? But you know what the scripture says of who God is? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting any to perish but everyone to come to repentance. You see, God's timing just isn't our timing. Yes, it's perfect in his eyes, but not always in ours. So in the meantime, don't rush the work of God. Instead, trust the work of God. Boy, I wish that was easy, don't you? I, I wish it was easy to trust in the work of God. I wish it was easy to, to, to step back and say, okay, he's got to figure it out, but, but my ways aren't his ways. My plans aren't always his plans which means trusting God sometimes is difficult. And sometimes we put limits on God. 
Look, don't limit the limitless God. I heard it said like this, trusting God's plan is the only secret I know and the gentle art of not freaking out. (laughs) You see, when we often get locked into believing a certain way, we then put God in this box. We ask for a specific thing. God, here's my problem. As if he was a genie, rub the genie lamp. He pops out, here's my problem, fix my problem. Give me this as my answer. But when you put God into a box, you miss out on the glory of who he is. We miss out by taking too much control, trying to work out our plan, trying to solve our problems. And all along, all we are doing is closing our eyes to the work that God has and is doing in our life. You know, we learned last last week that nothing is impossible with God, that God specializes in doing what we thought could not be done. So Jesus waits. He waits two days and then he's like, all right, guys, it's time to go. And so he and his disciples pack up and they begin to head back uh, there. And they're like, the disciples are like, Jesus, we're headed to our death. All right, we're going to die because the religious elite were beginning to stir up trouble. Um, And and I always wonder, maybe maybe Jesus was slowing himself down to head back uh, there because he knew the religious elite were ready to, to come after him. If he waited two more days, he would have more time. It wasn't his time yet. But now he heads that direction. You know, Jesus didn't come as everybody thought he was going to come. He hadn't come as the conquering king. He he hadn't come to be a great teacher. He hadn't come to be a a miracle worker or a healer. Jesus had came with a precise mission from the very beginning, and it was still the same in this very moment. He had come for the cross. He had come for Calvary. He had come for you and me, and he knew what he had to do on the cross. It wasn't his time yet. And so verse 17, uh, he comes on scene and the story continues to unravel. It says this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, in Martha's eyes, uh, Jesus is a day late and a dollar short, actually. He's four days late. But that's the mind of limitation. Martha is limiting the limitless God. How have you limited God? God, there's there's no way. There's no way I'm going to get over that hurt. No way I'm going to fix that habit, that hang up in my life. I'm always going to struggle with this. No way. God, that person, there's no, no, they're never going to come to know who you are. They're never going to come to know Jesus. They're just too broken. They're too lost. Uh, you know, that, that relationship, oh, never going to be mended. It's never, I, I, I've done too much bad. There's no way you can work good in it. I'll, I'll never move past my past. It's always going to cripple me. We've all been there. Martha's saying here of, Lord, if you had been here, then something could have happened. It's her way of saying, now that you are here, you can't do anything. But maybe what didn't happen is a setup of what will happen. Uh, Catch what Proverbs 3 says. With all your heart, you must trust the Lord, not your own judgment. Always let him lead you and he will clear the road for you to follow. Just keep leaning in. Keep trusting. Don't don't rush it. Don't limit it. And finally, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie that that God somehow takes takes pleasure in your pain. That God is sitting up far and aloft, looking down on these measly little humans in the midst of their chaos, and he's playing some sort of chess match with us. And he doesn't care a bit if he knocks one of his pawns off the, the board. That could be no further from the truth. We know that from the parable that Jesus spoke to us of the shepherd with the 99 who left the 99 to go and find the one that God cares about each and every one of us in an individual and personal capacity, that God loves us and that God wants life for us. So Martha has come to Jesus limiting the limitless. And she tells him, Jesus Jesus tells him, Tells her, she, he says, what's the time out? He's going to rise again. Now, now, she believed that that was just like, she has just like a total like uh, religious response. I, I know, 
Yeah, I know he's going to rise again at the last day, is what he says. And then Jesus says these profound words. No, 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 no. I am the resurrection and the life. You listen up here. I, I, don't, I don't think she fully grasped it. I don't think we even fully grasp it. Then it says this in John 11, verse, verse 32. Let's read it together. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, here she is. She's doing the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if, if, you, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews whom had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then Jesus wept. You see, these five or six verses of scripture present a central idea of who God is. Let me just say it like this. The God of the universe is a God of life, All right? Don't you believe the lie that God intended death for us, that God wants death for us. No, God is a God of life. From the very beginning, that's who he was. He was the one that breathed life into us. Now we broke it. And so now he sends Jesus to us to fix it. God has always wanted life. I believe that's the reason why Jesus falls to his knees and he begins to weep. He's not weeping per se at the, at the exact situation of Lazarus in the tomb. I think he's weeping at the brokenness that death has caused. This was not what he wanted his creation to experience. The experience of separation and the brokenness of, of relationships that are had when somebody dies. He's just overwhelmed by the circumstance. It's a reminder of what he had come for, that he had come for life. And so with that resolve, he stands to his feet and verse 38 says this, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Verse 39 said, take away the stone. Interesting enough, Jesus is about to raise a man from the dead. And he's like, hey, would you guys all take that stone away for me? I'm like, could he not just go get out of the way? You know, like stone, right? And no, no, he, he instead, right, what's he do? He says, hey, would you guys help me with that stone? I think that's a tell to how God wants us to be a part of the ministry and mission of the gospel that he's saying, I, I want your help. I want you to be a part of the redemptive story. Now, you're, you're not the one that saves somebody, but boy, you, you sure can help move some stones out of the way. And so he says, move, move the stone. Then it's, then it's, it's great. This is a great, good, good line, right? But Lord, said Martha, the, the sister of the dead man, by this time, there's a bad odor. Actually, the King James Version puts it, he stinketh, all right? For he has risen... He, he, has, he, he has been there for four days. Four days. He hadn't, he hadn't been laid on ice. He hadn't been like 21st and century embalmed. No, they had wrapped him in some clothes, sprinkled some perfume on him, and stuck him in a cave, a hot cave, that is. And, uh, well, his flesh is doing what flesh does. It's beginning to rot. And he truly did stink. Verse 40. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you? That if you believe, you will see the glory of God. I'm wondering, is Jesus getting frustrated at this point? Verse 43. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come out. The Greek word for this is a shout or a cry. It's only used eight times in the New Testament. Six of those in the Gospel of John. Four of those when the crowds cried out, crucify him. And then one right here, come out, come out of the grave, come forth. And then verse 44, listen to what it says. The dead man came, came out. You see, God's plan is always bigger than our plan. God's way is always better than our way. God's power is always more, more beautiful than we could ever imagine. God wants the same for you. You see, Jesus doesn't want just a part of your life. He wants to be your life. And when you've experienced that, that's when you've truly experienced life. Wonder what it was like. I mean, like, what, went, what was going on in Lazarus's mind? 
Was, was it like a, like a computer, like restarting, like Windows 95 coming up, right? I mean, like, how, how did he come? What, what did he, would he just like all of a sudden, like, boom, here he is. Come out, come out. And so he stood up, he's wrapped in all the burial clothes. I mean, think mummy, right? And what's he do? Now, I, I think that he just simply walks towards the light. He's in a dark tomb, the stone's been rolled away, and he's heard, come out. And so I think he stands up and he begins to waddle the best he can to come to the light. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to Christ? When you, you first came to know who Jesus was as Lord and Savior, it wasn't messy, was it? It didn't necessarily have to be complicated. I was young, I was 12 years old. It was simple. I was a sinner, I'd made some mistakes. I'd done a lot of things that weren't God honoring. And Jesus was the Savior. All I knew was that. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have it all figured out. I still really don't. I just needed to go towards the light. John 8, verse 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you first come to Jesus, it's just that simple. I was in darkness, and he called me to light. He called me to experience him in all of his fullness. I think that's why Jesus talks about childlike faith. Because as a child, like my three-year-old doesn't worry about, he, he doesn't understand days and concepts. He'll be like, last week, and last week was yesterday to him. I mean, he just, he, he's oblivious to time and frame. He just like, I'm going to wake up. There's going to be food on the table. My mom and dad are going to make sure, you know, my rear end's wiped and I, uh, I'm taken care of and I have fun. And he just goes about his day. But what happens, right? We wake up and we become adults. And then all of a sudden we get, we get stressed out and we get worried and we, uh, we begin to fret and we begin to think about the bills and the problems and all the difficulties we have and then we begin to overcomplicate it. Sound a little familiar? Maybe you've done that with your faith. Wasn't it so much more simple? When you first heard him say, come out. And all you knew was, I need to go to that. I need that. That light, that life that he has to offer me. Maybe for you, you just need to be reminded of that this morning. Maybe you're, you're saying, I had never taken that step and you just need to hear it right now. You need to hear, come out, come to the light. The second thing is this, come to liberation. You see, when Lazarus came out of the tomb, he carried the remnants of the grave. He carried his, his burial cloths. He was walking around alive, but he still looked a little dead. Like Lazarus, we were dead. We were dead spiritually, dead in our trespasses. Like Lazarus, we've been called out, called to pursue something different. And part of that pursuit is to get rid of the things that are hindering us. John 11, verse 44 says, the dead man came out, his hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and his cloths were around his face. Couldn't even, couldn't see. The grave clothes represent the hurts and habits and hangups. They represent the, the things that the world is holding on to us with, trying to stress us out and, and burden us with. John 14, or John 11, verse 44 says, Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Again, he, he, he says to, to, to them, take off, take off the clothes, get rid of them. And it's the same with us. We got to go from the old life to the new life. Uh, some of us need to have this, this uh, death to life experience. You've never taken the step of baptism. On April the 11th, the week after Easter, we're gonna have a special baptism service. And I wanna encourage you, if you've contemplated that step and you've got some questions, start asking those questions. Let us help answer those questions alongside you. And let's prepare you to take that step of faith as many others do on April the 11th of giving your life, going from death to life moment. Ephesians chapter four, verse 22 says this, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self and to put on new self, <laughs> created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So some of you are walking around like it's a zombie apocalypse, like get rid of that stuff. As the Hebrew author said, you know, throw off the things that hinder and run the race that's marked out for you. So what is it for you? Is it the pride that says, I will be enough for myself? Is it the drug that says, oh, when I, when I have that, I feel good enough? Is it the lust that says, I need that to, to have enough? 
And on a side note, again, he asks the crowd to be a part, right? Take off his, his outer garment. Take, take, take those things off. Get rid of those. They're hindering him. It's the importance of the church, the body of believers, that we need one another, that we need other people around us. Can I just say this? If you're here right now or, or you're joining us online, you guys are just getting like a smidge of what the church can be in your life. The church is it's called to be so much more. You, you need people that will wrap their arms around you, be there for you, encourage you, sometimes give you a swift kick in the butt when you need it, right? You need other believers in faith. We've got a, a thing you've been hearing about over the last few weeks called Rooted. It's a, an experience, a 10-week experience that really just challenges you to take the next step of faith in your life. And there's going to be other people that do it with you. They're going to journey alongside you, and you're going to be encouraged by it. Let me, let me tell you this. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to head out to Connection Central after service. Uh, ask the question online with us. Get connected to Rooted so that you can take some of those next steps of faith. Other believers can be around you, and they can help you to strip off the old layers, the old self, and to put on the new self. And then the final thing is this. Come to life. <laughs> Jesus' death is nearing. If you read chapter 11 through the end, the plot to kill Jesus is in full swing at this portion. Right? He's come, he, he's raised a dead man to life. They're like, this guy, we got to get rid of him. And Jesus uh, knew that in order to call us out of life, he had to give himself up unto death. And listen to what John 12 verse 1 says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Wow, that's an understatement, Right? whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus lived. Jesus wants us to experience the fullness of life that he and he alone can offer. I think sometimes the greatest deception that we are fed by Satan is that following Jesus, being a Christian is no fun. That, oh, the people over there look like they're having a good time, but, but oh man, those, those people, they just look like they're, they're boring old, old folks, right? Now. Now, Jesus says, you want to come to have true life? And the adversary comes to still kill and destroy that. But I've come to give him life and life to the full. Yes, you see, Jesus doesn't want just a part of your life. He wants to be your life. But when you give your life over to Jesus, you get so much more in return. Lazarus lived. He lived. And God wants you to live. He wants you to experience this world in all of its glory. And then someday to experience a world where there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no tears, there are no, no, more, no more death. Matthew 16, verse 25 says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, for me, will find it. So how will you be remembered? Remember, it's a loaded question. As someone that's been called out of the grave, <laughs> called out of death, let's be remembered for Jesus. Look, I, I, don't, I don't really care if 100 years from now, my, my great, great, great grandchildren don't, don't know my name. But here's what I do hope. I hope that I give a little bit of Jesus to my kids. And because I gave Jesus to them, they give Jesus to their kids, and they give Jesus to their kids, and they give Jesus to their kids, and there's a heritage of faith that is found in my family. I hope that the people I interact with, the ones that I love and care about, the people I, I run into at the, at the stores are the ones that I get to minister to at the church. I hope they come to know Jesus in me, and they see Jesus in me, and because they see Jesus in me, they give it out to somebody else and they give it out to somebody else, and they give it out to somebody else. You see, I hope I'm remembered for Jesus because I know this, I'll be remembered by Jesus. Someday, we are all gonna stand before the creator God. And he's gonna look at us, and if you've trusted Jesus, you know what he's gonna see? He's not gonna see, he's not gonna see all your sin. He's just gonna simply see his son who gave his life for you, and he's gonna look then at you and say, well done good and faithful servant. And you'll be welcomed to the kingdom of God for all of eternity. I want to be remembered for Jesus and by Jesus. And I hope the same for you. You know, today, some of you are hearing this for the first time. Come out. 
And you need to take a step of faith. You need to simply say, it's time to come out. And I don't know what it looks like exactly, but I'm just gonna go towards the light. And some of you have heard it before. You've taken the step, but you just need to hear it again. Come out and you need to start living in the liberation that God has for you, living in the life that he wants for you, living for him and experiencing him in all of his glory. Let's take those steps of faith today. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the truth and the promises that are spelled out for us in your word. And uh, man, the story of Lazarus is awesome. Uh, The story of death to life. And the more and more I think about it, it's my story. It's our story. When we trusted you, you told us, come out. And we're beginning to experience the fullness of life that only you can give. God, I pray if there's folks in the room that haven't taken that step of faith, that today's the day they take it, that they begin to prepare their hearts to ready themselves to experience the coming out into the fullness that you have to offer them. Don't, don't let them complicate it. Let them keep it simple. And God, I pray that for us that have experienced that, that we would live in it. We wouldn't stress out. We wouldn't worry. We'd just simply trust you knowing that you're doing something mighty and awesome and that, God, you are a God of life. God, we love you and we thank you and we say all this in Jesus' name, amen.